I'm Daniel Shore. That astute lawyer politician Richard Nixon once said, the lesson he learned from the Algerhis spy case was that the cover-up of a crime, perjury, is more dangerous than the original act. It was a lesson he failed to apply to Watergate with consequences cataclysmic for his presidency. In June 1972, President Nixon flew home from Moscow having just signed the first superpower treaty to limit nuclear weapons. He was re-election bound, an international hero, but about to become a domestic villain. Well, of course, it will not be lost on uh, many people in his audience, both in the Capitol and elsewhere tonight, but uh, this is a pretty good way to uh, impress a lot of voters. The President of the United States. I suppose this is just about the peak of Richard Nixon's political career this moment. As Nixon savored his triumph, five of his men were arrested in Washington, caught red-handed inside Democratic Party headquarters in the Watergate office building. The same team had committed other crimes for the White House. The president and his inner circle saw no option but a cover-up. It was a program or a concern for containment to keep this problem and this investigation and, and the story, the publicity on it and all that limited to the Watergate break-in. break-in had been planned, paid for, and executed by Nixon's campaign committee. But its high command was not in Washington on the day of the break-in. They were in California to campaign with a key figure. Back in Washington, the man in charge of the fiasco at the Watergate had to make a difficult phone call. And I wanted it to be uh, an absolutely secure conversation. I still had a White House pass. I went over into the White House and I went into what is known as the Situation Room. There was a KYX uh, scrambler phone over there uh, and it would be available. Well, of course, there's no scrambler phone in the hotel where I'm told Mr. Magruder is. So I called Magruder and I said, look, I need to speak to you securely. There is a missile base, a guided missile base run by the Air Force just in such and such a place. Go down there and hit Magruder. Why do I have to go to a missile base? Why do I have to talk to this company? You know? And I said, look, I need to speak to you securely. <laughs> All I thought was there's Liddy playing his, you know, little spy, spy games again. Magruder used the most secure line available, the hotel payphone. Liddy told him that four of the men arrested, the same Cuban Americans that used before, couldn't be connected to Nixon, but the fifth man could. He was James McCord, who worked full-time for the president's campaign. Now Magruder had a difficult message for his superiors. He said, we got a slight PR problem. And uh, I said, well, if it's a PR problem, that's your bailiwick. He said, uh, this is a PR problem that requires a lawyer. Their thoughts turned to Richard Kleindienst, Mitchell's successor as Attorney General. He had the power to order McCord's release from jail, but getting him to do it would be an obstruction of justice. You know, I just, I, at some point, somebody, I don't even know, I don't, I don't know if Mitchell said this, I don't know if Marty Anderson said it. Hell, I may have said it. Let's call Kleindienst and find out what's going on. But the Attorney General wasn't home. Their next call, as this phone bill from Mitchell's suite shows, went to Gordon Liddy's number at Nixon campaign headquarters. John Mitchell wanted me to get a hold of Richard Kleindienst, who was then the Attorney General of the United States, 
and to say that he, John Mitchell, wanted Richard Kleindienst to get McCord out of jail because McCord was the security chief of the committee to re-elect the president. Direct connection. Liddy tracked down Kleindienst at Burning Tree, an exclusive golf club outside Washington. They met in the locker room. Whereupon I said, okay, uh, I don't know whether you've heard about the break-in or anything. And I said, I have to tell you, that was our operation, my operation. I was responsible. He said, oh, God, you know. I said, yep, I made the mistake. He said, General, he said, John Mitchell told me to tell you to get these people out of jail right now, and I mean right now. And I said, what in the hell do you think you're talking about, Gordon? You know, Kleindienst was just apoplectic. I'm not going to do what you said, and if you say anything like that to me again, I'm going to put you in jail. And, and I said, yes, I said, I, I understand. I said, you know, you know, God knows what could what happen to you if you do a thing like that. He said, Fuck what happens to me? What happens to the President of the United States I do a stupid thing like that? The newly sworn-in Attorney General ordered that Watergate proceed like any other case. Yet he was sitting on the information that could have cracked it wide open on his first day. Kleindienz didn't tell the Watergate prosecutors about Gordon Liddy's confession, nor about John Mitchell's criminal demand to spring McCord. The chief law enforcement officer of the United States was closing his eyes to the cover-up. That same morning, FBI agents in his department were struggling to make sense of the unusual haul seized from the Watergate burglars. When we went into the uh, uh, property room, of spread out on the table were uh, electronic devices, walkie-talkies, uh, cameras, um, a huge amount of film, and a uh, gym bag. Um, curious that I was, I opened the gym bag and saw more film, um, and then there was some tissue paper. And I reached in to pull the tissue paper, and out fell a little black device with a couple of wires on it. This device was one of several electronic bugs the burglars had brought into Democratic headquarters. The men also carry keys to their rooms in the neighboring Watergate Hotel. In Bernard Barker's room, the FBI stumbled across an innocuous looking clue. One of the agents while assisting uh, the police uh, was going through the dresser drawer and uh, being as thorough as he was, you know, just flipping through there, the paper goes up and there's this envelope. I had given a letter of mine to Bernie Barker to mail. Asked him to, when he left the hotel room where Lydia and I were, uh, heading out uh, for the elevators, I had asked him to take this letter and drop it in the mail chute. Howard Hunt's carelessness would cost a lot more than the $6.36 that he owed his country club. The FBI ran his name through their files and found he was a longtime CIA officer whom they'd cleared for White House employment a year earlier. A few phone calls confirmed that he was indeed on the White House staff. For Nixon's men, keeping Watergate away from the president was going to be a nightmare. A few hours later, the campaign high command, their wives and the first lady, Pat Nixon, were at a Hollywood fundraising party. There they hobnobbed with movie stars Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, and Charlton Heston. On one side, it was a great party. I mean, it was wonderful. The women were having a great time. My wife had a great time. On the other hand, I'm still on the phone talking to some of my staff, trying to figure out really what's going on back in Washington after this disaster that occurred the night before. I went to the room for something, and my wife said, Fred, what's wrong with you? He said, you, you look strange. You look like you're really upset about something. I said, I just can't talk about it right now, but something has occurred that could very well bring down this administration. If Nixon sensed a threat to his re-election, he showed no sign of it the next morning. All right. He was still relaxing in Florida. 
Uh, I came over, I saw the uh, Sunday morning papers and saw an item in the Miami Herald. Nixon has always maintained that his first reaction was anger. His line was that the Democrats kept no real secrets at party headquarters. It was the uh, most foolish, useless uh, political caper of all time, because what reason would anybody want to go, if you're going to do any bugging, you're going to bug the Democratic National Headquarters. Nixon needed someone at the White House to be full-time manager of the cover-up. The president's lawyer, John Dean, was perfectly placed to obstruct the criminal investigation. Dean is counsel to the president. He's liaison to the FBI and the police department and all of that. That is a natural part of his duties. When I arrived in the office, normal hours on, on Monday morning, Jeb Magruder called, told me what had happened, told me that Liddy had messed this whole thing up, and that he said, John, I can't talk to Gordon Liddy. You've got to talk to him and find out what happened and why. Dean met Liddy for his debriefing on a park bench across from an art gallery, just yards from the White House. I put him completely in the picture in a way so that he, being knowledgeable about these things, Dean could attempt to control the investigation and thereby the damage. I then finally said to him something that uh, disturbed Dean. I had in my head knowledge which could bring down a president of the United States. He said, John, I'm a soldier. He said, see that street corner over there? If you want me to stand on that street corner, you just tell me when and where I'll be there and you can shoot me. And John Dean said, well, gee, Gordon, I don't think we've gone that far yet. When Dean got back to his office, he discovered the crimes he would have to cover up didn't end at the campaign committee. They extended deep into the White House. Within the White House, uh, I was the president's line to the re-election committee, and Gordon Strawn was my line, and, and Strawn had the responsibility uh, assigned by me to stay abreast of all that was going on. Gordon Strawn asked for an urgent meeting with John Dean. He said, John, my files are clean. He said, I talked to Haldeman over the weekend, and I've gone through everything, and there's nothing there that's going to embarrass us. Haldeman had ordered the shredding of all the political espionage memos sent to him by the campaign committee. These were evidence of complicity in Watergate at the highest level. This was the most troublesome report I had had in my initial review of what was going on. Because I said, if Strawn knows, Haldeman knows. If Haldeman knows, the president knows. So I looked around and I said, this place is in a world of hurt. This presentation of Watergate is sponsored in part by American Airlines, Merrill Lynch, and Ford Contour and Mercury Mystique. Another day begins in Europe. just as it has for centuries. And as each new day arrives, so does a silver bird from the West. This morning, American Airlines will touch down in 12 European cities, in nine different countries, just as the new day begins. So whether it's business or pleasure that brings you to Europe, fly the airline that can have you there as early as tomorrow morning. American Airlines, something special to Europe. A new chapter has begun in Merrill Lynch's history in Asia. 
We are the first American securities firm invited to open an office in mainland China. Being there gives our financial consultants a different perspective, which makes a difference for our clients. The difference is Merrill Lynch. Here's an inside look at Ford Motor Company's latest achievement. Our worldwide team has created a car for the world with safety features years ahead of today's safety standards, a computerized transmission that adjusts to any driving condition, and a Duratec V6 engine that can go 100,000 miles without a tune-up. World-class features in a more affordable class of car, and soon you can drive one yourself. Ford Contour and Mercury Mystique, coming September. Tonight, study the behavior of the baboon on the nature of things. Then, meet the orangutan of the rainforest on the natural world. And convicts discuss life behind bars on Discovery Sunday, tonight on the Discovery Channel. The future. Are you dreaming? Is it real? Japan Dreaming. Monday at 10 Mountain, 9 Pacific, on Discovery Showcase. Each day you see the difference your United Way gift makes in our community. It's the difference between an infant born at risk or given the chance to grow, between a teenager losing hope or getting a second chance, the difference between the elderly feeling forgotten or finding love and comfort. This year, like every year, Comcast supports United Way. Hey, okay, smile. Be the difference. See the difference. United Way. You know, I talked my way into the design studio at Ford. And they showed me this family vehicle of the future. It has the room of a van, but the ride of a car. And they say it's quieter than you could ever imagine. Of course, it'll have dual airbags, four-wheel ABS, and some safety features I've never even heard of. So I said, what will you call it? And they said, Windstar. Well, then I said, when will you make it? And they said, we already did. <laughs> right, this I can see. On day three of Watergate, the White House was already up to its neck in obstruction of justice. There would be no going back, and the president's campaign committee still held the original evidence of the crime, the transcript of conversations bugged at the Watergate, codenamed Gemstone. I said to Mitchell, what should I do with the Gemstone files? And he said, I think you ought to have a fire in your fireplace tonight. Well, of course, it was in the late in June, a rather uh, unusual time to have a fire, but uh, that's uh, what he wanted to do, and that's actually what I did. Not all John Mitchell's problems were so easy to deal with. His flamboyant wife, Martha, a darling of the campaign, had a habit of making indiscreet phone calls. All right, Isabel, here's the scoop. I've never talked to her yet, but what I haven't gotten a good news story, so I automatically, she was in California, and, and uh, the Democratic headquarters uh, alleged bugging incident had broken out, and that was my immediate question. Well, what do you think about that? And she said, I've given John an ultimatum. This really set her off. While she talked to the UPI reporter, Martha Mitchell's security guard called Fred LaRue on another line. He said, Fred, Miss Mitchell's on the phone with Helen Thomas. Uh, she's telling her a bunch of stuff about Watergate. And I said, oh, well, she really doesn't know anything about Watergate. And he said, well, she's telling her a bunch of stuff anyway. What should I do? I said, well, just go pull the phone out of the wall. And uh, pretty soon, I mean, we, we didn't, weren't into a conversation, but I heard her uh, saying, get away, get away. And I didn't know what was happening, and then there was a phone disconnect. To keep her from talking about Watergate, Martha Mitchell was forcibly sedated and held incommunicado. Her husband found it easy to paint the affair as the antics of a hysterical female. Finally got him on the phone, and, and he, he was not too perturbed. He said, I love that little girl. He said, so it seemed that everything was going to be all right. Late that Monday night, the president returned to Washington and took the reins into his own hands. 
in the first few days after Watergate, uh, the, the president was proactive in this thing. I think partly because he's a compulsive conspiracy theorist um, and, and just couldn't leave the stuff alone. The president's conversations with his aides, which were automatically captured by his secret taping system, show that he devoted hour after hour to Watergate. For 20 years until his death, Nixon managed to prevent access to most of these tapes. Now, a tape not previously played in public reveals that Nixon was directing the conspiracy even earlier than had been known. He acted through his closest associates, John Mitchell, John Ehrlichman, and Chief of Staff Haldeman. President had an idea. Howard Hunt, before Watergate and his job at the White House, had been in the CIA. He was one of the officers in charge of the agency's 1961 Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba. Perhaps the White House could use Hunt's past to confuse the FBI. I need to work with the CIA. I work in the Bay of Pigs. I mean, he's done a lot of things. What I've got to get is that they can be isolated instances. Work for we got to be careful pushing that very hard because he, he was working on a lot of stuff. The problem is that there are all kinds of other involvements, and if they start a fishing thing on this, they're going to start picking up threads. And that's, that's what appeals to me about trying to get one jump ahead of Someone else who could lead the FBI to those other involvements was Gordon Liddy. He laid out for Nixon's campaign managers just what could come out. Liddy's warning was delivered back in the Watergate complex. It was not only the scene of the crime, but also home to many members of the Nixon set, including Mitchell's close confidant, Fred LaRue. Gordon commenced to tell us there were other things that had been done that we should be aware of. I said, well, what, you know, what other things? He said, well, he said, we've had an operation going, or Hunt's had this operation going. Uh, we've done certain things for the White House. Liddy told the tale of the White House plumbers unit and the crimes he and the Watergate team had carried out for the president. The most serious was a break-in mounted by Howard Hunt to neutralize Daniel Ellsberg, a leading opponent of Nixon's Vietnam policy. They tried to steal his psychiatric files and use them to smear him. If that came out, it could badly hurt the Nixon campaign. Well, when he started disclosing all of these nefarious activities that uh, he was involved in uh, at the behest of the White House, uh, and what he inferred was with the full authority of the President of the United States just appalled me. Liddy then told them how they tried to break into Democratic candidate George McGovern's office. Liddy had his own way of dimming the lights outside. I just shot out the first three lamps. The second three I found, uh, I, I couldn't get a clear shot at because of a uh, steel girder overstructure. So I called over uh, the ever helpful Frank Sturgis, who was a big bull of a man, and uh, he bent over, and I climbed up on his shoulders and was able to get up onto the steel scaffolding, and from there, I shot out the remaining three lights. I said, uh, 
Gordon, you told me that none of the Cubans could identify you. Certainly the man whose shoulders you sat on to shoot the light out could identify you. He said, no, he couldn't. He never saw my face. These problems could be contained only if the break-in team kept their mouths shut. Liddy explained what had to be done. The usual thing in a situation like this in the intelligence service is that they will have bail provided for them, they will have counsel, legal counsel provided for them, there will be support for their families. Martian and LaRue reported to John Mitchell, Nixon's closest political friend. He had to decide whether to honor the commitment to pay hush money. I said, John, you know, it's not just the Watergate. We have other potential problems here that could easily come up. Uh, and I guess we looked at each other and uh, at that point, we both knew those commitments had to be kept. That same evening, Mitchell got a call from the president, the first since the Watergate break-in. He was terribly chagrined that people in his organization uh, could have engaged in such a thing and that, uh, as I recall it, he said, I, I, I don't, I just wasn't uh, policing the people in my organization as well as I should have. Ted Longhurst with MCI, and because I joined Friends and Family too, I can show you how easily it works for me. I save 20% on calls to anyone I choose, no matter which long distance company they're with. For example, Jack, my brother-in-law, he's still with AT&T, but watch closely because Jack may switch to MCI's Friends and Family too. He'll do it if he's smart, which he's not, but if he does, I'll save 40% when I call him, and even though he doesn't deserve it, he'll save 40% when he calls me. Project of its kind, Ford Motor Company creating a car for the world with the Duratec V6 engine that can go 100,000 miles without a tune-up, all-speed traction control, and safety systems designed to meet 1998 standards. Our best designers and engineers from around the world have created world-class features and a more affordable class of car. The Ford Contour and Mercury Mystique, launching September. What if somebody invented a way to change some of our toxic chemical waste into something useful? Like energy. Now there's less chemical waste and more energy. It's not the whole answer, but it's a start. The 180 members and partners of the Chemical Manufacturers Association. Working for change. People ask me, what do you think Walt would have done? The one thing I do know that Walt would have done is something you didn't expect him to do. Back in 1937, you went to the theater to see funny little five-minute cartoon. Walt turned it into a genuine art form. When they nominated Beauty and the Beast for the best picture animated or not, wow. Fairy tales, the really good ones, do indeed have universal messages. With a play, the curtain parts, and this thing happens between an audience and a cast in a theater, and it's electric. I would say that Broadway and Disney and American Express all go together very nicely. Well, Beast has this problem with his hands, but I think he could probably manage to hold an American Express code. American Express is welcomed on Broadway and other magical places. Tonight, find out what it's really like to be behind bars. This is not scared straight. This is what you'll have to deal with for the rest of your life. The choice is yours. Choices. Then, relive one day, one typical 24-hour period in our country, where 61 people will be shot. A day in the death of America. Tonight, beginning at 10 Mountain, 9 Pacific, on Discovery Sunday. Thursday nights, nuts and bolts, tools of the trade, machines and magicians on the Discovery Channel. First, how do they do it? Step behind the camera and into the special effects world of movie magic. Then, they seem ordinary, but do we really understand what makes them tick? 
Look inside the secret life of machines. Thursday at 10 Mountain, 9 Central on the Discovery Channel. Five days after the Watergate break-in, the burglars were arraigned in court and released on bail. The president's men set about organizing their hush money. Richard Nixon's private lawyer, Herb Kalmbach, got the assignment. Kalmbach collected $75,000 of Nixon campaign funds, but he needed to find somebody to deliver it. I got a call to, to come down to Washington and to meet with Mr. Herbert Kalmbach. I came to the hotel in Washington, D.C. I came up in, uh, right away, he was, didn't have his socks on, and he apologized for that. And I'd been in the Army and the Navy, and he apologized for not having his socks on. At any rate, he got in, in, into this story that uh, he had met with John Dean, a park bench across from the White House. Dean said that on the highest authority, it was decided that Herb Kambach would provide funds and that Tony Alasowitz the only one that they could trust would distribute said funds to those who broke into the Watergate uh, building. So now he's, uh, he has an attache case and he's got 75 grand in it. The 75,000 now, he's taking it out of the attache case and putting it on a bed. Now 75 grand, you know, is quite a bit of lettuce. And there was a laundry bag in the closet, one of these that very thin brown paper that you put your laundry and leave it out the door. And I plucked all that cabbage, I put it into the bag, tied it up with the string, maybe twice over, put it under my arm, and said, we'll be in touch. Now I'll await your instructions. On June 23rd, day seven, the nation awoke to discover flooding in many of the eastern states. But Nixon's mind was on Watergate. On that day, he issued an order which, when it became public two years later, ended his presidency. What led to the order was a meeting between the cover-up's manager, John Dean, and acting FBI director, Pat Gray, who had alarming news about the investigation. On that morning, Dean called me with a report, as he did from time to time when there was some development on Watergate, uh, <clears throat> in which he said, and I'm reading from my notes here my notes say investigation out of control gray doesn't know what to do then i say they've found money out of mexican bank we'll know who the depositors were today fbi agents had traced the cash seized from the watergate burglars to a bank in mexico if the fbi was not stopped immediately it would discover that this money laundered in mexico came from the nixon campaign Fortunately for the White House, Pat Gray drew the wrong conclusions at this point. On the evening of June 22nd, I met with Pat Gray over at his office in the FBI. And he now was convinced after looking at everything that the most likely explanation for what had gone on was that this was a CIA operation that they'd stumbled into. Nixon's men knew the CIA wasn't behind Watergate. The FBI's confusion, however, gave them a plausible pretext to shut down the investigation. Nixon would say it was jeopardizing national security. After talking to Dean, Haldeman briefed the president in the Oval Office. The tape of this meeting would be the smoking gun that ended the Nixon presidency. I said, now on the investigation, you know the Democratic break-in thing. I mean, it wasn't Watergate then. It was the Democratic break-in thing. Now, on the investigation, you know, the Democratic break-in thing, it's not the, the problem there is that the FBI is not under control. Haldeman presented the president with the plan. Again, I'm saying what Dean, what Mitchell recommended and Dean concurred with, according to what Dean told me is for us to have Walters, Walters is the deputy director of the CIA at that time, General Vernon Walters, call Pat Gray, Pat Gray was the director of the FBI at that time, acting director, and just say, stay the hell out of this. This is a business here we don't want you to go any further on. And that was rather well because the FBI agents who are working the case at this point have been the FBI But would the CIA cooperate? 
Nixon told Haldeman to threaten CIA Director Richard Helms that if his agency didn't stomp the FBI, then the CIA's 1961 Bay of Pigs fiasco would be dredged up again. He said, when you get in, when you get in the people, say, look, this is the president now saying to me, look, the problem is that this will open the whole, the whole Bay of Pigs thing. The problem is that this will open the whole, the whole Bay of Pigs thing. My purpose, my primary purpose, as is clearly indicated by the tape, and I don't dispute it at all, uh, I wanted to stop the investigation, if possible. We got word that uh, Haldeman and Ehrlichman wanted to meet with Helms and Walters at one o'clock at the White House. And we went in to see uh, Mr. Ehrlichman who talked in a general way about the embarrassment of this and so forth and so on and people had shown excessive zeal and then Mr. Haldeman came in. The president has asked us to tell you that he wants, I think I said Dick Walters, to contact Pat Gray at the FBI and explain to them that exploring these Cubans and their ties and, and all that sort of thing and the money source may lead into all sorts of other things that we don't, shouldn't be getting into and that they should not go any further in that exploration. At that point, Haldeman carried out the president's ploy. He warned Helms that Watergate could reopen the Bay of Pigs controversy. Helms, a typically cold as a cucumber, icy, super spy type guy, came totally unglued. Frankly, to this day, when I think back on that meeting, it's a long time ago, but it didn't seem to me that any of these things made any sense much. He leaped up in enormous excitement, concern, and panic and said, this has nothing to do with the Bay of Pigs and there's no problem about the Bay of Pigs and the CIA had nothing to do with this and on and on and on and on. And he finally calmed down and they agreed that Walters would go talk to the FBI. Helms prudently complied he told General Walters to go to the FBI and ask Gray to cut off the investigation in Mexico immediately. The case agent, the agent in charge, Angie Lano, came to me and told me that uh, there'd been a halt. I'd asked him, you know, what was happening, what was, what was going on with the investigation in Mexico, and Angie told me there'd been a, a halt put on it by the CIA. I'm getting telephone calls from the assistant United States attorney, Earl Silbert, saying, Angelo, what's going on? And I'm saying, Earl, what can I tell you? Every time we want to do something, somebody says, hold, wait, stop, no interview, wait, hold, stop. Inside the White House, Howard Hunt had a safe crammed with files on Watergate and earlier covert operations. John Dean had it drilled open. I realize that some of this material is extremely explosive politically. Uh, some of it is probably direct evidence of crime. Uh, I went over to Ehrlichman's office to explain to him what we'd found in the safe. And he told me that he had proposed to deliver these contents personally to Pat Gray, who was the acting director of the FBI, and leave it to Gray's discretion then, so that if there were an investigation of what became of Howard Hunt's possessions, we could very truthfully say that we had turned them over to the investigators. I distinctly recall Mr. Dean saying that these files were political dynamite and clearly should not see the light of day. It is true that neither Mr. Ehrlichman nor Mr. Dean expressly instructed me to destroy the files, but there was and is no doubt in my mind that destruction was intended. Gray, a Nixon loyalist, took the files home and put them under a pile of shirts. Six months later, he would burn them with his Christmas wrapping paper. While their boss was concealing evidence, FBI agents were uncovering more. 
Combing through one of the burglar's address books, the agents were baffled by this entry. They discovered that Howard Hunt's telephone in the White House, WH number 202-456-2282, wasn't being billed in the normal way. The bill was being sent to a girl over in Alexandria, Virginia. So we said, well, that's strange. So we went to Alexandria and found out that she was a, an employee at the, at the White House named Kathleen Chanel. Kathleen Chenow, secretary to Hunt and Liddy when they worked in the White House Plumbers Unit, had typed all their memos, including break-in plans. Her knowledge could bring the investigators right to the Oval Office. She happened to be on holiday in England. The FBI sent a teletype to his man in London, asking him to track down and question Chenow. But the White House had been tipped off. Immediately we realized that, you know, if she was broadsided by agents, uh, no telling what she'd say. So we decided we had to find her first. And I don't think the request was over, was over here five or six hours when the telephone rang again and said, hold. And I said, on what? And they said, no interview of Chanel until uh, um, the White House, the White House is going to bring her back. We impressed upon her the importance to not spill the beans, if you will. We told her, first of all, these things were not relevant to the Watergate investigation. He told me to answer all the questions uh, truthfully and to the best of my ability, but to remember that I was under the cloak of national security, that I had had many top secret and intelligence clearances. They came under this broad category of national security, which... Uh, was a wonderful uh, uh, tool for us to uh, sweep a lot of things that we didn't want out to, uh, under the rug. The FBI questioned Chanel, but got nothing out of her. Two vital weeks had been lost since the FBI's Gray had stalled the investigation at the CIA's request. But his staff was straining at the leash. He called me and said he couldn't suspend this anymore. So I went to see him and I said, I have carefully investigated this matter. There are no operations of the CIA that will in any way be jeopardized by this. and You're perfectly free to do it. Nixon, on vacation in California, learned that Walters and Gray couldn't impede the investigation any longer. He put the best possible face on it. I called uh, uh, Pat Gray to congratulate the FBI on a very successful the operation they had in apprehending some hijackers. He then brought up the subject uh, of the Watergate investigation. He said that there are some people around you who are mortally wounding you, or would might mortally wound you because they're trying to restrict this investigation. I said, Pat, you go right ahead with your investigation. Well, it's easy to miss the irony, perhaps, in this, which was that this whole thing was Richard Nixon's idea to involve the CIA in deflecting the FBI. The president promptly came up with a more brazen scheme to scuttle the Watergate case. To pull it off, he needed some hostages. What he would do is uh, cause a bunch of uh, Democrats to be uh, arrested, and then he would grant clemency to both Democrats and Republicans. Ehrlichman's note shows that they plan to tell the Secret Service to book and charge anti-Nixon demonstrators. And then the day after the election, the president would issue a general pardon, which would also quash the Watergate investigation. But there were still four months to election day. Nixon's re-election machine looked unstoppable. But he knew if the Watergate burglars started talking, there could be trouble. So his campaign funds were used to buy not just support, but silence.
It began as a third-rate burglary. While we would pull what is called a black bag job, a surreptitious entry. It would end with the downfall of a presidency. And then you destroy yourself. Watergate. This in-depth home video set contains rare interviews, recently uncovered documents, and lets you hear the player's story in their own words. To order this fascinating five-hour video for $49.95, call 1-800-652-2400. Hi, I'm Erica Seelinger with MCI. You know, 12 years ago, the cost of an average long-distance call was over $5. Today, that call is only $2.70. Now, what could have caused those rates to drop? MCI. We helped open telecommunications to free enterprise and helped America save billions of dollars. And now we're introducing our greatest savings program ever. Join and save 40% to every MCI customer you choose. Give us a call and start saving 40%. Retirement years should be secure years. That's why Merrill Lynch has a gerontologist to help us understand the social, emotional, and financial needs these years bring. That extra insight can make a difference between seeking security and finding it. The difference is Merrill Lynch. Here's an inside look at Ford Motor Company's latest achievement. Our worldwide team has created a car for the world with safety features years ahead of today's safety standards. A computerized transmission that adjusts to any driving condition and a Duratec V6 engine that can go 100,000 miles without a tune-up. World-class features in a more affordable class of car. And soon, you can drive one yourself. Ford Contour and Mercury Mystique, coming September. Choices! You've got to make choices. Kid, you want to fly? You got to buy. No! Exercise the right choice. Visit your local park and recreation department today. What's hidden below the surface? What secrets are to be revealed? Tuesdays. A legendary journey. A river of graves. Fact meets fiction on Terra X. Then, for treasure, science, or pleasure, why do they do it? Explore Undersea Worlds, Tuesdays, beginning at 9 Mountain, 8 Pacific, on the Discovery Channel. Through every stage of life, your United Way gift makes a difference in our community. It gives a child like Casey a chance to grow healthy and strong. It helps a teenager like Myron get an education and a future. It offers someone like Mary love and comfort in her later years. From all of us at Comcast, thank you for supporting our United Way. Thank you! Be the difference. See the difference. United Way. How strong is your resistance to the idea of the freshest, most taste-tempting seafood in town? Enjoy our complete dinners, including brochette of scallop, linguine with chunks of fresh clams in a white cream sauce, monkfish known as poor man's lobster, or orange roughy mesquite broiled to perfection, jumbo shrimp on a bed of fresh linguine with marinara. It's all a matter of willpower. The Seafood Bay, 1333 North Glacelle. Go ahead, give in. As the cover-up continued, Howard Hunt and his wife began taking delivery of the hush money to distribute to the burglars. I'm going to do these drops at the airport. And I would, uh, because lockers were always handy. I get a locker number, I take the key, put the money in the locker, take the key out, and I would tape it underneath the telephone. Then I would call on another phone, I would call the person, whatever name we used, Mrs. Hunt in that time, one time Mr. Hunt appeared and picked it up, and I'd say the key is taped on there, you take that key and go and uh, go to the locker and pick up your drop. And that's the way we did it. And we, it worked very well. Nixon's men paid out more than a quarter of a million dollars in hush money that summer. It did the trick. The burglars kept silent. So too did Howard Hunt and his partner in crime. Gordon Liddy had now become a prime suspect. 
we called over to FBI headquarters and we said we identified another person uh, can you run this name and within minutes they come back and say G Gordon Liddy former FBI agent well you know by now I'm going you know what is this CIA people FBI people you know what is it you know real what is going on here who's hiring all these people and why the way the conspiracy appeared to us to be shaping up with Liddy at the top based on the evidence we had, if it went higher, and we didn't know whether it went higher, the logical person based both on position and responsibilities would have been Jeb Magruder. Magruder is deputy campaign chief had to explain away nearly $100,000 that Liddy used for Watergate. Magruder concocted a story that the money was budgeted for campaign security, but that Liddy, all on his own, decided to spend it on a break-in. Now, what I had to do was, number one, I had to go to the prosecutors and tell that story and make that believable, but number two, I had to have somebody to back it up. Well, I refer to this as the sting. Um, I w was in my office, and Jeb came to the door and asked if I could join him in his office. Well, I pitched it to Bart basically on the basis that I needed his help, that uh, uh, we were in a quandary, that this guy Liddy had gone off on his own, had uh, done these things that had uh, really created problems, but we had to have some way to justify giving him the money. Magruder asked Porter to corroborate the story of a meeting at which Liddy's $100,000 budget was supposedly approved. Basically, the bottom line was, if anybody asks you, it's kind of if anybody asks you, whether it was an attorney or whoever, anybody asks you, it would be helpful if you could remember a number like around $100,000 that we discussed at that time. And uh, so without much ado, I, I, uh, my big error, of course, was to that I said, yeah, I would do that. They would have to testify under oath before the Watergate grand jury. If the prosecutors and the jurors didn't swallow their story, Magruder would be charged. Inevitably, he would drag Nixon's top aides down with him. We were all aware that I was going to go up and perjure myself, and that was the way the cover-up was going to work. You go up and you testify to the, uh, why we spent the money with Liddy, and then you bring Porter in and he tells, backs up your story. Uh, we were not uh, five-year-olds. <laughs> It's a lawyer's distinction, but I must say, and it's self-serving, that I did advise him. I said, Jeb, I can't tell you to go in front of that grand jury to perjure yourself, but I will tell you, I'll give you a good question, and I know exactly the kind of questions they're going to ask you. And so I spent about a couple hours just grilling him and getting him ready for his perjury. Magruder took his oath and told his lies. Then it was Porter's turn. I had to repeat uh, this particular story about the about the hundred thousand dollar amount, uh, and all the rest of it was uh, all the rest of what I said there was quite factual. Uh, my mention of the hundred thousand uh, dollars, as as we know, was not. For the moment, Magruder got away with it. Federal indictments were returned in Washington today in the Watergate Democrats bugging affair. Complaints. Sources here at the Justice Department say the investigation by both the FBI and the grand jury is over. There is no evidence, they insist, that Outside anyone else was involved. The last witness was called this morning, virtually guaranteeing there will be no trial before Election Day. On September 15th, the four Cubans, Anne McCord, Hunt, and Liddy, were charged. No one else. We had contained the matter during the campaign uh, because I didn't feel at that time uh, that any erosion of the, of the strength of the president in the country, of his support in the country, and also I didn't feel that his defeat in an election uh, would be in the best interest of the country. On September 15th, came back to my office, Jane, my secretary, said, the president wants to see you over in the Oval Office. I was really quite surprised. The basic reason for the meeting was to give John Dean a feeling that the president was pleased with his work and was thanking him for it, patting him on the shoulder and saying, good boy, well done. In essence, uh, uh, the president said, you know, just want to tell you what a good job you've done with the cover-up. What surprised me is I really, for the first time, began to see who Richard Nixon was in this meeting. He sort of let down and began to tell me about how 
we've got to uh, get after our enemies that have done us wrong during this whole Watergate matter after the election. On November 7, 1972, Richard Nixon carried 49 of 50 states, re-elected president by the biggest margin in history, and it looked as though he had gotten away with his crimes. Want to know more about the corruption of American politics and the fall of Richard Nixon? Watergate is also a book by Fred Emery, who covered the scandal as it happened. Ask for Watergate at bookstores now. Up next, Watergate continues on the Discovery Channel.